All right. Uh, I think. Uh, environmentalists uh, should at least uh, be as interested in uh, the engineering part because it's with the engineering part that we get the performance like the, the hydropowers that a lot of energy policy relies on or you know, is justified on. So, um, and, and it's a good, it's, it strengthens environmentalist arguments if the engineering capacity and the the capabilities to, to maximize the, the benefits uh, the, uh, uh, that would serve the energy policy of the country. If we can't do that, we lack the energy uh, engineering capacity, uh, the environmental arguments are only strengthened. So I think it's very important for environmentalists to be as interested in the engineering aspects of hydropower as they are in the environmental aspects. Because if we look at it from a cost-benefit uh, perspective, uh, the benefits often rely on engineering know-how. Uh, so that's that's where we need to really understand it. Uh, okay, so now we're to environmental social impact assessment, which is a critical component uh, of um, approval and uh, operation of small hydropower in Norway. We are in the process of getting a new environmental impact assessment law approved in Armenia. Um, there's a lot of uncertainties. The draft law has uh, a lot of strengths and some weaknesses. Uh, I don't know what has been the status. Arthur Sari, did uh, the EIA law, uh, is it being redrafted? Is the, because uh, for some uh, unknown reason, small hydropowers were taken out of the category that would require an EIA. Is it put back in now? Uh, it is required, but in <coughs> It is required to conduct an AIA, but uh, in the most weak uh, conditions. I mean, there are three conditions, A, B, C, and uh, small hydropower stations were put in C, and this, this was like uh, our mistake. We just uh, yield the uh, pressures of Ministry of Energy, and it, it was put on category C. But we are cardinally against this uh, solution, and uh, we try to get it back to B. And uh, now uh, the draft law is in Parliament, and uh, there are no yet, uh, not yet conducted any hearings on the law. Uh, after the first hearing, uh, we'll do our best to um, get back, get back to the section B. Okay, so with B. that, let's go to the gold standard that Norway will offer us. Parivar will give us uh, their experience. It seems very interesting from the very brief overview of her. Yes, uh, thank you. <coughs> yes, I'm a biologist myself, and I'm also head of the energy department at uh, this company in Trondheim. And there we are about uh, 35 colleagues. Uh, we are biologists, hydrologists, and uh, civil engineers, and uh, machine and mechanical engineers. And we're working together to try to develop uh, sustainable hydropower. Uh, hydropower uh, do not uh, lead to serious uh, pollution and it not leading to serious uh, global climate changes, that's true. But still it may uh, lead to serious damage on nature values and biological diversity. So, uh, uh, in fact, uh, some rivers or uh, part of rivers and streams are too valuable uh, for the environmental aspects that uh, hydropower should be located there. But uh, at many other locations, it's quite okay if uh, um, the plant, the, the design is done properly. So, so they're asking that you move the top a little bit so they can hear it. I think they're also interested. Yeah. It's better? Okay. Yes, what I will focus on in uh, this lecture is uh, uh, the history of Norwegian hydropower. It's quite different from the Armenian. 
and the whole hydro program may impact the environment. And typical char characteristics of small hydro power compared to large ones in Norway. And what's the purpose and nature of social, social and environmental impact assessment? How to achieve sustainable power plants? Uh, what uh, may be the main negative impacts on the environment from hydro power? And in the same way, uh, when it comes to social impacts, but it's also possible to achieve some local benefits other than the power production. And have some examples of useful mitigation measures. <coughs> In the total world, about 20% of the electricity comes from hydropower. And uh, the largest producers of hydropower in the world, that's China, Canada, Brazil, the United States, and Russia. Uh, in Norway, about 70% of the stationary energy consumption is electricity, and almost all the electricity is made by hydropower. So, uh, the hydropower, this is uh, different years up to 2005, and the blue section here is uh, hydropower, uh, and then we put, uh, have some oil consumption, and also uh, uh, bioenergy, that's uh, wood fire, almost. And since uh, 95, also some gas, uh, is used uh, in stationary energy consumption. But most of it uh, hydropower. And the authorities, the NVE, as uh, Wolf mentioned uh, in the last presentation, uh, has uh, calculated the, the total uh, potential of hydropower in Norway. I also think it's done something like the, that here in Armenia, but I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, the red sector here is uh, what is already exploited. And uh, the second largest part is the blue one. And uh, that's a protected river. Uh, 388 uh, rivers or parks or rivers and streams. Uh, are protected against uh, hydropower. Mm -hmm. And the meaning of this is to, uh, to protect uh, uh, the nature of rivers and streams uh, in Norway in different parts of the country and different kinds of rivers. Steep rivers, waterfalls, lakes and all kinds of, of water. And uh, it's a lot of applications for evaluations. That's uh, seven terawatt hours. And under construction, 1.2 terawatt hours. And uh, the rest of the potential for new small, small hydropower is calculated or estimated to 15.2 uh, terawatt hours. Uh, excuse me, can you please say what, what do you mean saying protected rivers? Is there a definition, protected rivers, what is that? Uh, in protected rivers, uh, you cannot achieve a, a license uh, to develop uh, hydropower uh, bigger than or larger than one megawatt. In what conditions? Because, uh, uh, because, of because we want uh, to protect uh, all that uh, rivers as a nature element. But it's defined by law? It's in the law that you can It's not a special law, but it's uh, a decision made by the parliament. Uh, we were told that uh, there is salmon <laughs> industry. Maybe. That's why also. Uh, a part of it, but, but mainly nature conservation. Mm. It's okay.
Yes, here is uh, Norway, the western part of the Scandinavia. And uh, the topography is like we have uh, high mountains towards the west, and also here in uh, some of the northern part, it's high mountains. And therefore, it's a short distance from mountain to sea level. And therefore, of course, it's uh, well shaped to develop hydropower and also a lot of rain and snow in Norway. Uh, the large uh, hydropower plants uh, usually have large man-made reservoirs in the mountains so that we can produce uh, a lot of hydropower during winter time when it's cold and ice cover the, the lakes and rivers. Uh, the power grid on national basis is owned by a state company. And uh, during the last hundred years or so, we have adapted the laws and regulations due to experience over a long time. And uh, about uh, 1970 to 1980, it was a lot of protest against uh, further development of large hydropower plants in Norway. And then uh, the parliament started to protect the rivers again against uh, hydropower. But uh, today the small scale hydropower uh, have to take care of environmental aspects in a much better way than, than earlier. Is there a cultural aspect on protection of rivers? I mean, water flows, cultural aspect, not only environmental, etc., but cultural. For instance, is there uh, the river can be protected or considered as a protected river if there is water flow, well, waterfall, sorry, waterfall mm -hmm. in there. I mean, cultural aspects of, uh, to, to, to be protected. Yes, yes, of course, due to uh, tourism, landscape, uh, and so on, also. Yes, that's very important. Good. Thank you. Uh, this is a typical uh, impacts from traditional large-scale hydropowers in Norway. It's uh, big fluctuations, and uh, they do often have significant negative impact on landscape. I'll show you a picture afterwards. And res in reservoirs, uh, it's caused uh, washout in the littoral zone and provides negative consequences for the vegetation, birds, plantic fauna, and fish stocks. The regulation uh, has implications for water flow, temperature, etc. downstream reservoirs. And that's uh, very important to, to look upon when we discuss what will be the impact on fish stocks. The temperature will be quite different. And also transfer of water from one river to another causes changes in water quality and also in distribution of species. This is a typical reservoir in the uh, Norwegian mountains. And uh, uh, it's a big difference between the highest and the lowest regulated water level. So the landscape is, of course, uh, uh, impacted. And also the biology, the literal zone, as you can see. But the situation is uh, quite different when it comes to small hydropower. This is a typical uh, small hydropower station. Uh, the pipeline is uh, a spurred penstock up here and into the intake. Mm -hmm. uh, environmental flow is released uh, in the water flow. In the water flow, sorry. Uh, and it's uh, not usual to have a storage or transfer of water between rivers when it comes to small hydropower. But uh, the head varies a lot. I said between 10 and 500 meters, but it can also be more or less than this. Uh, the com most common way to 
uh, to build the penstock is as uh, buried uh, in soil, but it can also be as uh, a tunnel construction. But that's uh, more expensive, so it has to be uh, a large, small-scale outer pour if uh, that could be a good solution, both for the economy, production, and environment in the balance. Uh, release of environmental flow is always an important question. Uh, it's not uh, easy to explain this if uh, you are not familiar uh, with the Q95. Uh, but uh, the meaning of this is the open <coughs> discharge uh, is bigger than Q95 in 95 percent of the time under natural conditions before uh, the river is exploited to hydropower. So it's not related to amount, a special amount of water, but 95 percent of the time. And that's uh, a common way to decide the release of environmental flow and it's often divided between the summer season and the winter season because the winter season is usually quite different. It's very little runoff compared to summer. But if uh, it's, uh, it is a special interest like uh, salmon stock, uh, a very pretty waterfall or, or something, it may be quite different decisions on release of environmental data. <coughs> that was it. Uh, we have had a, a real boom in development of small hydropower in Norway recent years. Uh, several hundreds of applications have been sent to the authorities and in our, at our office alone we have prepared approvals and impact assessments for more than 150 plants. And we have prepared tender documents for more than 50 plants, detailed plans for landscape and environment uh, for 30 plants, and detailed technical design uh, for 30 plants, including dams, pipes, and power plants. Uh, and we also do advisory service for electromagnetic magnetic equipment during commission and operation phase. Uh, the system of uh, impact assessments varies uh, uh, in a way between countries, but uh, it's always based on the same principles. And the EU uh, have established a system during the EIA directive uh, and that uh, have been enforced since 1985 and the directive has been amended three times since then. So Norway is not a member of the European Union but uh, over the system when it comes to the impact assessment follow the same principles. So. And that's common throughout the world. And what's the purpose of a social and environmental impact assessment? Of course, it's uh, an aid to decision making. Uh, should uh, the permit be given, and if it will be given, on what um, What about cost benefit analysis about the aim of environmental assessment? Sorry. I mean, uh, uh, environmental impact assessments, there are aims, right? Oh. So, uh, you mentioned those um, goals, but not that I, I don't see cost benefit analysis within the environmental impact assessment. Because, uh, for instance, impact on agriculture. Yeah. And uh, it is loss, for instance. And is there cost-benefit analysis uh, before, um, before, before um, 
maybe before certifying the project. Yes, yes it is. Yes it is. There is that, that's also. a part of the process. Because in Armenian legislation there was not, but in current draft uh, we included uh, this part. This is still very high level, so we're going to go deep. This is still very high. And the process uh, can also help the developer or the, the owner uh, to take in the account uh, uh, statements that uh, it should be done in another way. And then uh, the possibility to achieve the permit uh, will rise. And of course, uh, it will strengthen democratic values by public participation. Uh, it's always sent on a broad hearing. Uh, and every organization and also single person can make their statements to the, to the plan. So overall it's a good instrument for sustainable development. bit more about the procedure. As I said, it uh, will vary some between countries, but it's based on the same principles. Um, the developer must at an early stage submit a notification document to the competent authority. That's NVE in Norway. And the notification shall include a proposal for a study program, and that will be carried out in the impact assessment procedure. The study program is open for public consultation. And the SEIA process shall focus on the issues necessary for decisions on the projects and various uh, development options should be assessed. That's all a, a good uh, start to have uh, for example, maybe the, the pen stock should go on this side of the river or this side of the river. What would be the best solution when it comes to impacts of uh, farmland, uh, habitats, and so on? And the report should always include a do-nothing alternative. What is the expected uh, situation in this area in some years if the farmland not, will not be realized or established. Yes, both uh, regional environmental authorities, NGOs and other relevant organizations as well as the general public to participate in the process. And when the impact assessment document is prepared, a further consultation, a public meeting with the developer and the responsible authority. Here both authorities and NGOs can properly evaluate whether the impacts of the project have been satisfactory assessed. And that's uh, some of the answer of one of the questions after the last uh, presentation, I think. It's uh, very common or usual that uh, the authorities uh, says that uh, the impact assessment document is not good enough at this stage. You have to do more. Mm -hmm. but that's, uh, that's very common. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the hearing parties can say uh, the study program says uh, you should also investigate the bottom fauna, for example. And it's the and if this is not done properly, we have to do it before our permission is given. And also the developer or the owner has the opportunity to make comments on the statements from the hearing before the authorities make their final decision. And both the developer and others have the right to make a complaint to the decision that will be re-examined by the ministry or energy when it comes to our report plans. Including to the court, right? Complain to the court. Not to the court, to the, to the ministry instead of the directorate. One level up. Mm -hmm. But not in the court? Do they no, have access no, the, to the court? The court is not uh, involved. 
In Sweden, the court is involved. That's uh, some differences between countries. So the, the full uh, impact assessment is necessary for how the power plants uh, uh, bigger than 30 or sometimes 40 GDH a year. But when it comes to small hydropower plants, it's uh, only uh, one round of public hearing. And that's the main difference. But also for small hydropower plants, uh, it's an uh, open hearing that is uh, uh, presented both in local papers on the internet and on NVEs uh, on the internet. And I think, uh, uh, what, sorry, one thing here that the authorities decide if the uh, small hydropower get permission, what alternative which is preferred and under what condition the permission is given. And uh, today, uh, about 40% of the applications will not lead to a permission. And that's mainly due to. Uh, too much negative impact on the environment. That's the most common reason. And uh, the number of uh, uh, plants that not will uh, achieve a license, that's rising in Norway now. That's because uh, we have uh, had a, a lot of uh, application uh, recent years, and uh, the best sites are already taken. And um, therefore, it's natural that, uh, that it's not so easy to get a license anymore. And I think it's uh, also very important that the authorities have uh, their own inspection on the site before they are doing the, the final decision if a permission should be given. They are not only reading the documents. I think uh, I, I've said this before, and uh, the time is running. And then uh, something about the quality of an impact assessment. Uh, it's said in the law in Norway that uh, the investigations and the assessments should reflect the size of the planned program and expected impacts. So if we mm -hmm. talk about a very small plant, you should not have to do so much in investigations <coughs> as on a large one. The people involved in the assessment should have the knowledge and experience needed, not only regarding the biology, but also the nature of the impact mm -hmm. assessment procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, local people do often have important knowledge regarding the influence area. Mm -hmm. This should always be issued uh, in service. And my own experience is that that's very important. You cannot uh, read everything or find everything when you are out in the field, but uh, people that have lived uh, there for a generation, they know a lot. First statement here. Um, does that assume there's pre-selection of projects, or there's a, there's categories already? Is, so is this many no. gigawatts? No, there are there are not. But uh, the authorities uh, do not expect so much investigations in small. Uh, so just because it's small, they don't expect. Yeah, that's not right. Not that there's nothing else considered. Where it is situated. So what what do you but mean if you say small? small? <coughs> if uh, I want to understand, it's one megawatt, two megawatt, small, <laughs> not category. Yeah, I'd say it, it no steps, but it's from very large to very small. And uh, they expect uh, uh, desk studies and a brief tour to the site uh, if you're talking about one megawatt. But if you're talking about 100 megawatt, you have to uh, use maybe three months in the field to investigate and find out uh, about everything. 
What about 10? What about 10 megawatts? Yes, and uh, please in the middle. But it's very difficult to give an exact answer. Ah. But uh, if the law says it should be uh, reflected, the size of the, the plan, what uh, do you have to investigate? And what about the place of the hydropower plant? Because yes, that's it also. Is near to the uh, uh, recreation uh, zone or something else? If it is near to the special protected area, mm -hmm. I guess uh, there should be more, like, uh, more more public hearings ju ju than just one. Uh, it will not uh, be more than one public hearing, but uh, then we have to investigate what will happen to the protected area. Special. Mm -hmm. That will be a special interest, uh, topic of interest, if that's the situation. And if we have the uh, Atlantic salmon, this will be a special topic of interest and so that's different from case to case. So not the, the uh, criteria is not only the size, but the place as well? Yes, that's right. That's right. And uh, to involve the public and uh, and all the people, it's very important that uh, the document should not be prepared as a, uh, for our colleagues, <coughs> but it should be prepared for everybody. Mm -hmm. So it should be easy to understand what, uh, what is the plan and what would be the impact. Mm -hmm. We don't want to make an impression on colleagues, that's not the meaning. Yes, and, uh, and we do this. Uh, first, we do a registration of elements like biotopes, birds, fish, plants, species, etc. And then we have to determine the importance or the, the value of the different uh, environmental topics or issues. And uh, the Norwegian authorities, uh, they have made the guidelines to safeguard that uh, every consulting firm are doing this on the same way. So uh, it's not uh, dependent on what uh, type of uh, firm is doing this investigation. Mm -hmm. And I think that will also help Kevin and Mena, I think, some guidelines. What is serious damage and what, what is okay? What would be the physical changes that will occur due to the HPP? Uh, and, and, and the value of the nature on the one hand and the um, amount of influence and changes in the physical uh, conditions uh, will lead to the, the conclusion on impact. And it's very important that uh, this is independent part of the procedure, value and impact. And at least we will try to find uh, uh, mitigation measures. And if we can see that uh, a release of a higher amount of en environmental flow is positive, we also have to calculate what would be the cost for the owner to do that. That will help the authorities to make the right decision. Yeah. Again, uh, this is a uh, good explaining what I just said, but uh, I'm not using time here, I think. Uh, what would be the physical changes? Uh, this is a real plan. Uh, or a map or plan. We have the intake and some uh, terrestrial area will be inundated uh, on the part of the river between the intake and the outlet from the power station. Mm -hmm. It will be reduced water discharge and uh, it's necessary to construct a, a road up here to get the equipment to the intake, mm -hmm. and also the 
the grid or the connection line uh, from the power station to the existing grid. And this is a list of typical environmental elements that can be, can be influenced, uh, endangered habitats, uh, like this gorge, is a special area for uh, some plants, special lichens and, and mosses, and this is a very limited type of <coughs> area in Norway and also in other countries. So some specialized species are living here, but uh, if the amount of water uh, is reduced, uh, the humidity of the air here is in influenced, and uh, uh, the situation for those special species may be changed. Uh, red list species, I know we have a very uh, good red list for Armenia, and we also have that in, uh, in Norway, and we have to make comments on what will be the situation for red listed species. And wild fish populations, of course. Uh, in Norway, it's often the situation uh, that small hydropower is developed uh, in very steep part of rivers, and uh, they don't have a special value for fish. But not always, but often. The aquatic productivity in respect of benthic fauna will be reduced, and also landscape qualities. Uh, the population in general is often uh, most conscious about the landscape changes and also uh, fish stocks, of course. So the gorges and waterfalls are examples of endangered habitats. And also land areas that are frequently flooded are habitats for specialized insects, birds, trees, and shrubs. Yes. Just some pictures representing red listed species. Uh, Nesting sites for a small red listed woodpecker. Um, the otter and some lichen species. This is a picture of Arctic char. And uh, migration obstacles and reduced water flow can cause major negative impact on fish stocks in some of the uh, localities. Come back to that. Yes, I see the time is running. Uh, we are doing a lot of monitoring of uh, fish stocks. Uh, the, uh, the density of young fish especially from Atlantic salmon and broad trout, uh, is calculated by using a special kind of electric equipment. We catch all the fish uh, in area, uh, or we try to catch all the fish in area, and we uh, try to fish uh, three times over the same site, and we can see that uh, the number of fish caught will decline from time to time. And um, then we have a special formula to calculate the total number of fish present. Uh, water birds, of course, can be affected, and especially water birds as ducks and waders. Uh, and we have at least uh, one bird species in the common. In the, uh, <coughs> I have uh, seen the deeper there, and it's also it's a national bird in Norway because we have a lot of waterfalls and streams, and the deeper is there for the year. Uh, we have also to uh, to look uh, more briefly, but we have to look also on uh, 
uh, social impacts. And of course, reduced water flow, dam and stock and even power lines may be negative to landscape qualities. And uh, the tourism depend on the landscape uh, in Norway. Um, the fishing possibilities can be reduced if the fish stocks are affected. And also if uh, the power station is planned located near houses and people, noise can be a problem, especially for from Pelton turbines and not Francis turbines. And it will be less water for other purposes, like uh, irrigation, not a problem in Norway, but uh, very important topic in other countries, and also here in Armenia. But we do use water for, uh, for example, uh, fish farming. That's important in Norway. Some picture is from uh, trips uh, to sites. Here it was planned to build uh, a dam and uh, to make a visualization afterwards. We stood on a line here mm -hmm. so that we could produce a visualization of what would the dam look like. Mm -hmm. And uh, the authorities uh, say we have to vis make visualizations of dams and power stations and also what will the river look like with less water. Yes, cultural her heritage. Uh, sometimes, the, sometimes the authority uh, demands archaeological excavations prior to development. And in Norway, rain day herding. Uh, is important, especially in the northern part of uh, Norway. Mm -hmm. And we all have also to make comments on forestry and agriculture. Is it positive or negative uh, impacts on these topics? Yes, the Pelton turbine is uh, used if you have the relatively small water, little water discharge, and a large head. And the Francis turbine is better if you have a lower head and a bigger discharge, water discharge. But uh, this one gives uh, a lot more noise than this one. But we also have some uh, local benefits, of course. Um, and it's very uh, important to look, uh, is it uh, possible to achieve more uh, local benefits if you uh, think about uh, roads, is it possible to use them for other purposes, um, and so on. And uh, in addition to energy production, it will be income for land owners and it will be taxes for municipalities, counties and the state. And uh, construction phase will lead to employment and often uh, lo local workers. Additional benefits, um, as I mentioned from roads, also use of rock material and you could uh, uh, construct water supply for drinking water and for fish farming from the same dam and penstock if you're planning with that in mind. Uh, in our experience it's uh, uh, very useful that uh, both biologists and civil engineers and hydrologists uh, look at the possibility and the site at an early stage. 
And earlier it was very common that uh, we biologists came in when the plan was uh, yeah, <laughs> constructed maybe, or uh, the plan was established. And then we should uh, make an uh, impact <coughs> assessment, what will the impact be? But it's very useful that we also came in in the process very early. And then we can tell that uh, you should not uh, place the dam there, for example. So you should uh, go 100 meters further down to avoid the uh, conflict with this special part of the river, for example. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, a question. Uh, well, is there any regulation to support this collaboration between you? No, 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 it's not, but uh, it should be. Yeah. Should I have a few more minutes? Mm -hmm. It's six o'clock, it turns out they're coming at six o'clock, yeah. so we have a few more minutes. Okay. Appropriate uh, mitigation measures, uh, fish passages is uh, of course very important and uh, then you should uh, think about uh, both upstream migration and downstream migration. Fish ladders to, to lead migrating fish up beyond the dam uh, is a lot of uh, experience on that but it's not so much experience of successful downstream migration. It's important to lead the fish outside the, the power plant and uh, yes uh, and also the bypass valve is you are you familiar with the bypass valve that's uh, uh, sometimes the power plant uh, comes to a certain stop mm -hmm. that's not planned and that will lead to that uh, the water discharge will have a sudden drop downstream the outlet from the power station. And that can of course uh, lead to a, a massive death of young fish. So the meaning of the bypass valve is to safeguard that if the power plant comes to a sudden stop, uh, the water goes beyond the power station and in the river at once. Environmental flow we have uh, discussed, and also the revegetation or influenced area uh, is important. And uh, uh, spreading of uh, species is a serious problem to uh, biodiversity. So we don't want to uh, to bring seeds into the uh, this site. We want uh, revegetation revic to be maybe a bit slower, but uh, from the species uh, present in the area. And a lot of that depends on your baseline study to know what is. Yes, uh, and how do you carry out the, uh, the pipeline? And uh, it's buried, but then you can place the top layer to side and play it back again mm -hmm. after that and stop your spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a typical uh, fish ladder for salmon and brown trout uh, in Norway. We have a lot of them and uh, most of them uh, function very well. But uh, uh, it is very important to, to uh, construct fish ladders uh, that is uh, sufficient for the uh, species present. That's also the situation uh, in Norway, uh, and I think it's even more uh, important here in Armenia. Because uh, a lot of species uh, is not uh, able to make a jump of uh, jumps of 40 <coughs> centimeters and so on. And as I have mentioned here, uh, a fish ladder should have two or more entrances to ensure functionality at several rates of flow. 
it's not necessary, but uh, it's a very positive element. Yes, uh, to find the fish ladder and to move <coughs> into the first chamber. Uh, mm -hmm. That's an important topic. Um, this one, this is an example, this is not functioning well. And I want to, uh, to mention that in the EU and uh, in Germany in special, they have planned to invest about uh, 1 billion euro in fish passages mm -hmm. in the coming years. So it's a lot of interest and focus on fish passages. This is a five-star fish now. Sorry. This is a five star. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And five star the power out, maybe. Yeah. That's not a small scale hydropower. Yeah, no. sure. Yeah, it's uh, <coughs> located in uh, River Mosel, a large tributary to the River Rhine. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And a lot of species is um, passing through more than 20 species. And different species have different abilities to force fish ladders. Some species can withstand high water velocity and have no problems of jumping. Ability increase with individual size. That's uh, that, uh, it's important to know. Ability improves with increasing temperature to a certain limit. And that limit is different from species to species. Difficult obstacles will only be forced in Daylight, we can use that. Uh, it's not necessary to have a lot of water in fish ladders during dark. Uh, some degree of turbidity will increase migratory acti activity, while very high turbidity will re reduce the migration behavior. In the hand there is uh, one small uh, Atlantic salmon at the top and a brown throat in the bottom. Uh, survival of fish that migrate downstream through a power station varies depending on turbine type, turbine size, the head and the fish size. Uh, a recess or a hole in the dam has shown to be effective for leading fish to the river rather than passing through the plant. Uh, for example, the European eel, they uh, have to have a hole uh, in the bottom of the dam, but the young Atlantic salmon have to have the hole near the top, mm -hmm. so it's different. And the sign of the water grid in front of the intake uh, and the current velocity is of great importance to avoid fish from passing through the power plant. Uh, a vertical grid is not good. The fish then want to, to pass through. But if the grid is laid about 45 degrees, mm -hmm. the fish want to go down into the hole. They want to try to find other solutions. That's uh, uh, new knowledge and very important in design of problems. Yes, when do you need to have a bypass valve? Uh, we have helped the authorities in Norway to, uh, to make the guideline <coughs> on uh, bypass uh, valves. And if the economic, economic or biological value of the fish stocks downstream the power plant is significant, uh, then you should uh, have a bypass valve. If the discharge in the river upstream, the outlet is small compared to the capacity through the power plant, and the time needed for the water from the intake down to the outlet, if an enforced shutdown occurs, um, only in winter time, only a few minutes, it's enough to, to kill almost all the fish uh, near uh, the power station. So the time factor is important. And also the shape uh, of the river basin 
uh, comes to the, the foreground is important. And some uh, rivers uh, will, uh, will have uh, large uh, dry areas uh, if the power plant, power plant follows, but uh, in others it's small changes. And as a rule of thumb, the capacity of bypass valve has to be adapted in each case, but around 50% of the mean discharge is often sufficient. Yeah. And some um, pictures of uh, one uh, waterfall at uh, different uh, discharges. And it's also uh, the discharge is uh, related to the uh, to the mean value of discharge in this river and also the Q95. And we have uh, uh, a measure, we measure the discharge in this river and we have set up an automatic camera to take photos uh, every day. And then we can show how will the waterfall look like in different situations. So this is the waterfall at the medium discharge. Uh, here we are uh, high uh, discharge. Uh, it's estimated or calculated to Q4. 9.45 cubic meters a second. There have half the value. And here, a smaller one, Q89. That means uh, the discharge is greater than this in 85% of the time in under natural conditions. Okay? 89%. 89%. Is it wrong? Yeah, it's not. Oh, that, that's good. I just want to understand you correctly. Okay. And this is the Q95. Uh, that is uh, often set as uh, demand on environmental flow. And also we have situation, natural situation, with Q99. This is chosen as the level of release of environmental flow. Okay, I'll clean that. Thirty times. As I said, in Norway, approximately 40% of the applications are not leading to a permit uh, this year and last year. This is mainly due to expected negative in environmental impacts. And if a permission is given, a detailed plan for landscape and environment has to be accepted by the authorities before the construction can start. And the detailed plan for tent uh, allocation and land use plan uh, focus on the most important environmental aspects to avoid serious impacts. That varies from case to case and uh, describe a system for documentation of environmental flow, as Wolf <coughs> told us, and a checklist for documentation of environmental control during construction. Yes, okay. Thank you. <laughs> we have time for a few questions, maybe five minutes, no more, because there's another group coming in here, so we need to leave. Our search count by its Ingro Valley John Nocturne of the Nourish will be good. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for a very interesting presentation. Are there in the same river uh, fishes with different behavior? If yes, how you solve the issue of uh, fish leather construction? How, how will I recommend a fish ladder? Yeah. 
How do you address and uh, if uh, you have some standards or for fish leather design? Uh, okay, we have, have no standard, but uh, we have to uh, document or describe that uh, the fish passage, passage is, is uh, suitable for the species present. And uh, now we are constructing a fish ladder for in a small stream uh, for smaller trout. And then we said that uh, the jumping height should not be more than 25 centimeters, for example. This is designed for the weakest, right? Yeah. Um, you spoke about the assessment of impact on biodiversity. Uh, do you have uh, like methodologies how to assess it, that impact? Because in Armenia, we don't have any methodology, nor legally binding or non-binding, how to assess the impact on, uh, by the, on the elements of biodiversity. This is the first question. And the second one, uh, how do you take into account the public opinion? I mean, public. What, what, for, what is for you is public interest. For instance, if anything is legal in terms of legislation, but uh, community is against, for instance, uh, historical, cultural aspects, etc. They don't want to see that uh, power plant in that in their area. Is it obligatory, or how much is it obligatory? So those, those two questions: assessment of uh, methodologies of assessment and public interest. Yes, uh, we have a guideline for uh, as a methodology for assessment, but. Uh, to set the right value on the different environmental topics, that's the most easy part. But uh, what uh, we expect as a influence from the hydropower, that's uh, not so easy. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some guidelines, but I don't think uh, this should be improved a lot also in Norway. Uh, what is the experience, what will happen to it different species uh, if the water level is, re it is reduced, for example. Mm. It's not done much on the such types of topics, so we have to use our experience as biologists to, to tell you what do you think and why. But uh, the guidelines uh, are still not uh, sufficient. What about the public okay. opinion? And the public opinion, that's uh, an issue for the authorities is uh, if, uh, for example, the municipality, uh, local municipality, says we don't want that uh, hydropower plant. Uh, almost always the state authority uh, take that uh, statement and will not give per permission. Uh, if it is uh, uh, one person, uh, he will not uh, get through the system. But uh, if it's um, uh, several organizations, uh, they will be, uh, be heard. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? But uh, I have to add uh, something uh, that uh, we have uh, some organizations that always say no, yeah. and they will never be heard. Ah. <laughs> we, we, uh, everybody will uh, know that they will say no, always. Do we have the list that's of a, those that's not, good, uh, <laughs> that's not a good strategy. Mm. Yes. I mean, justified uh, this, this. Yes, I have, a, I have a question here. My name is Magnus Silvia, and I'm from Sweden, but I'm part of this German team here looking at uh, the developments here in Armenia. And one reason why I'm asking the question now is that uh, KFW, who is actually funding some of those uh, investments here, they have recently adopted new, uh, let's say, sustainability criteria. And one very important factor for KFW, German government, is actually the climate adaptation and impact. So there's a time factor here. And uh, during our discussions here this week, we have learned that uh, <clears throat> the lifespan of this kind of investment is expected to be around 30 years. And I think, I know, I know for sure, because there is very good data on climate change uh, 
uh, here from Armenia, that there will be, in many regions of Armenia, there will be tremendous changes of flow, yeah? up to 50% maybe in, within 50 years or so. And so my question to you is, do you sometimes take into account the time factor and the climate adaptation? And is there something like adaptive management built into this system? I think that you, want, as a hydrologist, should uh, answer the question. Yeah. Concerning the hydrology and the safety, it is uh, definitely taken into account. Uh, for example, the flood calculations, uh, uh, we have uh, studies over, no over the whole of Norway, which uh, you also mentioned for Armenia, okay. they are indicating some changes, and we have to uh, calculate what uh, effect these changes will have on the flooding levels, for example, and by this on the dam safety. But uh, for the environmental uh, aspects, uh, I think it's not... Uh, taken into account very much yet. That's right. Mm. And also the, the developers uh, of power stations uh, usually uh, don't uh, use these uh, changes, I think, in their calculations for the economic values uh, yet. Uh, I have ne never seen uh, or very seldom seen that they do it. Usually we, we use uh, historical values after a certain date, so uh, uh, to to product power, to calculate the power production, so it, uh, it could definitely be used. But I think for Norway, it's a more conservative method not to use it uh, because uh, in most areas uh, the flow will uh, be higher. There's a positive trend for that, but uh, we have to take it into account when we are calculating. Uh, uh, bridges and so on, yeah. as a safety. Seven seconds. <laughs> yeah, in all of these uh, safety connected uh, calculations, uh, it is taken into account, yeah. Okay, everyone, thank you very much. The last word goes to Andre Mishkosan, who has been a uh, great colleague throughout these three years. Thank you, Al. Thanks, Terry Wallenwolf, for your very interesting lectures and for the questions and answers uh, following those. Uh, I just wanted to um, make a few remarks connected to the presentations and, uh, and also some of the questions, because some of the questions come up again and again on um, both methodology for uh, environment and flow environmental flow uh, assessments uh, and uh, methodologies for um, environmental impact assessments and uh, monetary values uh, of ecosystem services and uh, often the question comes on what is the right methodology what should be the environmental flow what how to put the monetary value on ecosystem services and I think that the general answer, uh, several times the answer came here that there are no fixed methodology, uh, we have some guidelines, and I think that um, uh, there should not be uh, fixed methodologies for these things, because as Pelibar said, you need to use experience and make independent uh, calculations and assessments in each different case. It's dangerous to use fixed methodologies for these things because then you risk um, making the right assessment in one out of ten cases whilst the rest of the nine uh, have characteristics which makes the fixed methodology not applicable. So uh, uh, I think instead of searching for or, or requesting a fixed methodology or a fixed guideline uh, the approach should be to acquire as much knowledge as possible in each different case and to spend enough time uh, in order to do this. And that was one remark, you know, too quick. Uh, the second one is, I think it's important to acknowledge also that 
uh, of course, Norway. We have some experiences here from Norway. So Norway does not have a perfect system, of course. We have our challenges. Uh, we have had a lot of challenges, debates, protests during the past, uh, during many decades. Um, and uh, what works in Norway might not work in Armenia, but we have gained some experience which, uh, which might uh, be uh, a value also for other countries. Uh, as one example, the one-stop shop at NVE in Norway, the attentive listener might have seen that this is not under the Ministry of Environment, but under the Ministry of Energy, which might uh, be unusual, but this works in Norway due to the tradition we have had to build capacity uh, within this agency, so it not, it's not necessarily so that this would be advisory uh, in Armenia. So, just a general remark on this. That being said, we have, throughout um, the last couple of years, or nearly three years, worked hard together with a lot of stakeholders in uh, Armenia, from the government of Armenia, from the civil society, from private organi organizations, to assess um, uh, the state of affairs in the Armenian uh, high, uh, small hydropower sector, uh, also comparing to the Norwegian uh, experiences. And the results from these uh, assessments have uh, are a set of recommendations for uh, how uh, certain issues might be improved uh, in Armenia. And uh, those results can all be uh, accessed through the website which Wolf had uh, on his uh, first slide, uh, www.smallhydroarmenia.org. Um, uh, and uh, we hope that uh, these recommendations might be, at least some of them, implemented. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions to these uh, reports or results, please uh, send an email. I, I have my card, business card, or of course to colleagues in Spain. So that's it. We'll finish now. Thanks a lot to AUA for uh, facilitating this and to the. Uh,